Yo, what's up? It's someone that's no one, and welcome back to another Substance Explain episode. This time we're covering a poisonous orange mushroom that's gotten the nickname of jack o lantern mushrooms because of their appearance. And that's Uncle Otis Hilarious. Now, we haven't talked a ton about mushrooms on this channel, but honestly, they're one of my favorite kinds of substances. So I definitely wanted to talk about these guys today and see what they're like in death. Besides psilocybin, that is, I do wonder what other mushrooms there are that can provide a psychoactive effect. Amanitas are a species that get brought up often, then I also see a lot of things from the herbal and supplement community, like lion's man and reishi, among many others. But that's only really scratching the surface of the species out there. Here's one we had a report of not too long ago, and one I thought has some unique properties. The poison is one of them, but also how it's bioluminescent, meaning it glows in the dark. Yeah, pretty damn cool. So I figured, let's check this out. Let me know what you think of this and what I should cover next. Without further ado, let's dive right into this. So always with this series, we gotta start with the origins of the substance. For chemical substances and over the counters, this has been a lot easier as those are human produced. But like the last episode, we're covering a plant, specifically a fungi. The first mushroom we're really taking a deep dive into. We haven't gotten around to talking about mushrooms in depth like that. We've broken down Amanita a little, but I feel like this here will be our most introspective shroom video yet. But because this is naturally occurring, its actual origins are theorized. And Omphalotus solarius is a specific and more obscure mushroom compared to other shrooms out there. So extra emphasis on that theorized part. And really with something like shrooms, it can be tracked back and it's planned to up to over a billion years ago. Which, don't worry, we won't make this too complex. But fungi may have started as single cell organisms, where it's thought that all fungi do share a common ancestor. And this ancestor is debated upon, but to keep it simple, we'll just say it most likely was a form of microalgae. It's extremely likely that it started off in water and slowly made its way across the planet. As today, shrooms can exist in some of the most toughest, most obscure, and sometimes deadliest places. And there's many theories as to how this could happen. Plants could be highly responsible, a mix of moisture could have allowed for the transition, or even cold and icy conditions may be the case. However this happened, the fungi evolution has extended for hundreds of millions of years now. Today's mushroom, Omphalotus solarius, is a land mushroom. And to understand how this mushroom got its name, we had to take a look at the taxonomic history and the mushroom's characteristics. We won't cover the entire phylogenic classification here, but most of the relevant points. So obviously, it is a cellular organism and a fungi. Next, it's part of the Dicara subkingdom, which basically means at the cellular level, it doesn't have cells with flagella, which are cells with a tail pretty much. Think of sperm cells. Now a ton of mushrooms begin to separate there, but this falls into the Basodiomycota subdivision. This division is defined by a specialized cell process that involve Basidia and Basidia spores. As of the last century especially, this area has benefited greatly from DNA sequencing data and is even partially how the Omphalotus family came to be classified. Next it's in the subdivision Agaricomycotina, which is classified as having a macroscopic fruiting body. Then it's in the class Agricomycetes, which I do feel like this is the weakest classification right now, as this isn't really too defining, but specific on excluding different types of fungi, which common traits of this class can be seen in other classifications. But these groupings may sound familiar though, as next is in the order, Agaricals, are the Agarics. You may recognize that Alameda Mascara is one of these, with the nickname of Fly Agaric. But this order was actually a genus when it was first introduced, Again, we're just scratching the surface with the classification here today. But Agaricos was first described by Augustine Pyramus de Condole, a very respectable botanist in the early 1800s, as Agaricus alarius. Agarics are classified by a mushroom's gill like flesh, and also to be growing on the trunks of trees, which 200 years ago, this simple observation may have been fitting. But with DNA sequencing, new studies, new technologies, we've branched the classification of things much further, which this wasn't always the case throughout history. Obviously, it doesn't share this name today. So let's fast forward about 100 years later into the first half of the 1900s and enter Rausinger, 
regarded as one of the most important figures for classifying gill mushrooms in the 20th century. Through his research, he was able to classify and define this mushroom a lot better and separate it from other species. A huge finding came to be due with its decay state. Many mushrooms in this class and order do grow on decomposing matter, and at one point, that was just that, and it wasn't looked into further. But this state of decay differs from other species, in that it breaks down what is called lignin, complex organic polymers which make a lot of the tissue in plants, especially plants like trees and other woods. It was previously thought to break down cellulose, but this distinction itself warranted its own genus and family, and that's where Omphalotus came in which based off of these taxonomic origins, it's most likely Omphalotus solaris was the first species to be noticed like this. Omphalotus illidens could be another possible one, but seeing how much later it took the western world to pick up on this, it seems unlikely. The first ever account recorded of Omphalotus solaris, that I was able to find at least, dates back all the way to 1755 in France under the name of Polymyces phosphorus by Giovanni Antonio Battera. He named it this because of the phosphorus on the lamellae, and he thought they were edible. So the name Omphalotus solaris has come a long way, but Omphalotus itself has about 9 species across the planet, which yes, many characteristics can align, but also there are clear visual differences. These days DNA sequencing, mating studies, morphological studies, and more have been huge for determining this. And you may be wondering, what exactly does the name even mean? Well, it isn't just some weird random words, but Omphalotus refers to umbilicate. That's a reference to the navel central depression and mature caps, while the ompha part of the word refers to belly. As if you look at an any belly bun, it can resemble that umbilicate shape. While alarius means of the olive tree, which is where the mushrooms can be commonly found and associated with. And Omphalotus alarius actually only occurs naturally in Europe. Omphalotus hilarious used to be the scientific name that grouped all the species of jack o' lantern mushrooms, but now the hilarious refers to only the species found in Europe. But with that, that's pretty much all of the history and human involvement for how this mushroom exists today and how we came to identify and name it. So since that's all laid out, let's talk about the actual specific properties of this mushroom and what makes it so unique. And then after, we'll discuss there being a possible psychoactive effect with these. But just looking at this mushroom, it can look interesting. It's a bright orange that grows in clusters, sometimes an orange yellow or an orange brown. Like I said before, it most likely is going to be by or directly on wood, dead wood, trees, or something of that nature being a part of the ecosystem. During the day, this just looks like an orange mushroom. The caps are wider than most other shrooms, but it's at night when these little guys like to shine, literally. These mushrooms are bioluminescent, meaning they glow in the dark. This is a pretty complex process, and it's believed that the mushroom is tied to a kind of biochemical clock that behaves in a similar way to our circadian rhythm. Now, there may be differences across species, but it's thought that all bioluminescent mushrooms share the same process for light production. It's thought to be the same one fireflies undergo actually. But basically, there's these molecules known as luciferins, which is interacted with enzymes known as luciferase, along with some help from oxygen, water, and some action potential. And through a chemical process, comes out oxyluciferin, which is thought to be the emittance of light. Which just pretty wild when I found this out, that there's glowing mushrooms out there that occur in nature. Like this would be dope as fuck for a type of night garden or something. But why does this even happen? It just seems kind of strange, doesn't it? Well, we don't have a definite answer for this, which honestly, this is such a doable experiment that needs to take place. But it's most likely because of the interaction with the environment and insects. It could be a good predator trap for spiders, but it's most likely arthropods are attracted to it for a number of possible reasons. There may be a food source, there may be to lay eggs, whatever the reason is, this interaction could allow for the transfer of spores, like how flowers utilize bees to spread pollen. And also, the glow it makes isn't one like a light bulb, but it would be considered cool or cold, which probably plays a huge role into what it attracts. But while bugs may be attracted to them, humans have been also, in a different way, accidentally. This mushroom is commonly mistaken for the chanterelle mushroom, a very tasty good edible mushroom. But I said before, 
Omphalaris, on the other hand, is toxic. There are some key things to look out for, such as the gills, the size, if it's in a cluster, if it's growing from a tree or not, and so forth. Place and time of the year can also be important, as Omphalotus tends to grow late in the summer into the fall. But not everyone knows about this, and many poisonings have been documented. We covered a couple now actually that inspired the making of this video. A scout stream, where some campers accidentally took some, trying to get high not knowing what it would do, and then an outbreak of non-fatal mushroom poisoning with Omphalotus hilarious among Syrian refugees in Izmir, Turkey, where 19 people were admitted to the hospital for accidentally eating this mushroom. It can be very easy to mistake this if you don't know much about mushrooms. But in terms of the actual toxicity, there haven't been any fatalities reported from this poisoning. Not to say it is impossible, but you probably need a far bigger dose than what you're comfortable with eating. But still, this isn't like a walk in the park either. Many describe immense gastric stress, that is, loss of discomfort on the stomach. So cramping, vomiting, diarrhea, all very common reported symptoms and it can last up to a few days. And there's a couple of things and ideas tied to causing this. One thing that seems to be true is the presence of the toxin Illidan S. And this is where we'll bring out the possibility of a psychoactive effect, which I'll just say now does seem very limited, if at all. So Illidan S is actually a type of terpene coming from this mushroom. And this could be produced for a variety of reasons, but it's most likely for an evolutionary reason, and it's most likely that this toxin gave better chances of reproduction because animals and stuff won't eat it. Of course when we eat it, we see sickness and massive stomach distress ensue, which the activity with Illidanus is defined as antibiotic and antineoplastic. Antibiotic I'm sure you've had at one point, or at least heard of, but antineoplastic is something I hope none of us need, as those are substances prescribed to inhibit and prevent abnormal growths. In other words, tumors. So with Illidanus, DNA damage takes place here, a very specific type actually, where it's selective. Now because of this potential, this actually got picked up and developed at the University of California in the early 2000s, where they created an analog medicine called irofulvin. They had to do this instead of just isolating Illidan S, because Illidan S is just too toxic on its own. Irofulvin is much more tolerable. And like I said, the way it works seems to be very specific. But to make it simple, it would be ideally used for late stage tumors, where the irofulvin would target DNA and protein cells in the tumor and ideally interfere with the replication and cell division, causing apoptosis. Again, it seems like something that will vary case to case depending upon the kind of cancer, and the results have varied over the years. Though recent research does seem to look more promising with the methods taking place, giving many an impression that this can be a very valuable medicine at times. More research is being conducted at the time of making this. But that's what's known of this toxin of the jack o lantern mushrooms. What's thought to cause the main effects? Which, based on what's out there, is Illidan S or irofulvin psychoactive? In terms of irofulvin, I would say most likely not directly. Same of Illidan S. Side effects would include what you find on an Ophelotus hilarious consumption, with mainly vomiting, though some have claimed of visual disturbances but I would think it's most likely a coinciding effect of the intense nausea. That's probably what you would mostly get, though if you guys really want me to do a video covering irofulvin solely, just to try and see if there's something there, we can. Besides that though, there are some reports and information out there that suggest that Omphalotus hilarius contains muscarin alkaloids, that is, the alkaloids found in say, Amanita muscara. Based on what I found and the actual research done, I feel like this would have came up somewhere. Some subjective reports note that some muscarinic activity may be there, but it just isn't consistent enough that I would say it's going on. If we can confirm this, then I would be more open to the idea that there is a psychoactive effect. But it just isn't looking like that's the case here. If anything, the psychoactive effect would probably just be the state of hell you end up in because of how damn sick you feel. But with that guys, we're going to end things there for today. We really covered the major things concerning Ophelotus hilarious here, and I guess we could get more visual with it, like breaking down each part of the mushroom, but I think that will come more with time. The main thing is, I want to cover what the substance is essentially, the history of it, where it sits in society, scientifically, 
and of course how it all plays into the human experience. But let me know if I missed anything big, or if anything big pops up after this video, feel free to share it with everyone. I'm really happy to cover this first non-psychoactive substance in this series, and it really makes me feel like we can just take on about anything and everything there is out there. So let me know what you want me to cover next. Make sure to like and subscribe. It's been someone that's no one, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace out. Okay.